tired. Um, I had I had a pandemic epiphany. I'll just share, but not what's up? Uh, that actually, I learned how to be calmer during this pandemic time, and calm and okay with it. Like I used to be, I had to get out of the house all the time. I had to be on the go uh -huh. all the time. I had to travel all the time. And then when I couldn't do it, at first it was disappointing. And then I just got into a routine. And I was saying the other day, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything special. I just did my normal routine. It was really relaxing and huh? nice and calming and a lot more time for reflection and not dither and draw on hmm. and carry on. And so I think I came to a pandemic piece. Huh? That's cool. wonderful. And, I'm still and those are the kind of discussions we're having. Uh, in this pandemic wilderness was a, um, yeah, 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 that, 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 that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And being grateful for, for what I can't, well, being grateful, I don't yes. have COVID, being grateful to be alive every day to wake yeah. up, being grateful for having a house to live in and you got to let the eat small stuff. And, yeah. yeah. I think um yeah and, and, and tonight actually we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit in the pandemic wilderness just about what what sort of what sort of things did we learn about ourselves while we we're in the midst of the wilderness and uh, and, and, and what what's, what sort of hopes did we did we find um, I mean I've had a couple members say that they've actually gotten uh, they've actually worshipped more <laughs> during the pandemic that that was um and, and uh, uh, yeah and. I, I wish it made me more peaceful, Carol. So I'm excited that it, I'm excited that's what it did for you. Uh, hi, Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of pro concerns do we have? Judy Hodge. Judy Hodge for sure. Yeah. Someone we're very concerned about right now. Judy Hodge has COVID in in a really bad way and uh, was um, in. Uh, an ICU in one of our hospitals, maybe Grant, I'm not sure. Right. But yeah, an ICU. I saw and, she was on the prayer list, right? Yeah. So yeah, so she's still in, and she's still in pretty critical condition in the ICU. So uh, last update fire we had, which was last night, that I talked about it this morning. So Judy Hodge, Scott Warburton, one of our choir members, mm -hmm. um, has a uh, has a heart thing going on that's pretty serious. And uh, I'm just seeing a doctor today, so we'll want to we'll, we'll want to be sure to keep Scott in our prayers. Um, oh, here's Barb. And then um, who else? Uh, my sister is having a medical disease tomorrow. It's not. Just, uh, we don't know if it's serious or not. Uh huh. We get it checked out. So she asked for our prayers. Okay. Which is really good because she doesn't want to believe. <laughs> well, foxholes, huh? <laughs> so, okay, yeah, so what's your name, Carol? Diana. So, Diana's sister, or Carol's sister, Diana. Okay. Kimberly's last blood test was better. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, so is that a, a, a prayer of praise? That's a good one. Okay. Um, anyone else? Let's pray for Meg Reidler. She's in Alaska right now, and... Hopefully, hopefully everything's going going well. She was excited about this That's trip. Exciting. Yeah, she's on a cruise. Yeah, she's on a cruise. Oh, and, I hope that goes well. Oh, yeah, yeah. They did all kinds of different precautions. Uh, so I'm sure yeah, and Meg's health is so fragile, so we want to we want to keep her in our prayers. Um, anything else? Well, let's say a prayer. <coughs> Uh, Lord, we give thanks uh, that you've gathered us today. We give thanks for this Romans text. And uh, uh, even though it's difficult, Lord, uh, how, how much we can learn and grow from it. Help us learn and grow today. Uh, we, we lift up those prayers that are on our hearts. We pray especially for Diana, Carol's sister. Uh, we pray for Meg and John and Gary as they travel. Uh, may they stay safe, and, and may Meg stay safe, especially. Uh, we pray for um, Scott <clears throat> as he sees a doctor today, Laurel as she waits to relieve this pain. We celebrate with Kim that she's gotten some good news in the midst of so much bad news. We pray for our, our sister in Christ, Sherry Smith, and, and 
in the midst of just a, a series of bad events going on for her. Help her, Lord. Uh, we lift up Judy Hatch, uh, suffering from COVID. Um, an important uh, former leader in this congregation, Lord. We pray for our preschool and, and, and all the <coughs> changes going on down there. We, uh, we give time for other names to be settled on now. Hear these prayers, Lord. Bless us with your love. Amen. Okay. Well, thanks. So I shut that door. Or is it good to have that much grief going that way? Is it bothering you, Donna? When you're fired? Pardon? Is it bothering you, the door? I'm good. Okay. As <laughs> <laughs> soon as I get my phone turned off, I'll be really good. <laughs> the, um, well, welcome. I, uh, we, we, I was going to do two things today. And um, we had such a rich discussion on Tuesday morning. It used to be the pastor's class was before the men's group, but now it's the other way around. So, so you 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 you, you get my 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 rethought stuff that they used to get. But um, but but we did so good on Tuesday morning with just the first part, or or it was just meaty enough that we needed to talk about it more. So what you have here in the beginning is you have two really important verse sections. And, and if you turn it over, I've highlighted both of them. And the first one is three to four, and that's um, Paul's idea of the gospel. Okay? And that's where we're going to spend our whatever we have, a half hour, 40 minutes, whatever it is that we, we spend. That's what we're going to spend on. And then the second one is the theme of Romans. So six And 16.7 is actually kind of a famous verse. So you might... If, you know, seen it, I don't want to say quilted, what is it that they stitch into a pillow or something like that? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a little bit, it's, it's a little one of the more famous verses from Romans of Paul. But that's the theme, which is, you know, like when you wrote a letter in high school, you know, you were supposed to lay out the theme in the first paragraph and then, <laughs> and then extrapolate that in the second one and, and then, you know, close in the third paragraph, sort of, you know, you're... Uh, when they taught us how to write business letters or, or something like that. So this is similar. This is the opening he's expected to tell the Romans when the heck he's writing to them. Uh, what does he want to talk about? And so, so 16, 17 is the theme. And, uh, and, and, and we want to spend some time uh, tearing that apart um, next week. Uh, so, we'll, so we'll do this in two weeks. So you're, you're gonna, we're going to linger here. Uh, it's thick thick language and um, yeah so so bear with me as I try to figure it out with you <laughs> and then uh, and, 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 and let's not be too hard on ourselves and don't be too hard on me I guess is what I'm saying <laughs> More than anything. okay yep. so there we go hi Pat Pat Kerr has joined us online here Sandy's looking at her. <laughs> Sorry, Sandy. I tend to say hi to people as they, as they join us and know that it, so they know I've, I've seen them. Not seeing things. That's right. Um, okay, good. We're good. So I'm going to read all 17 verses. Uh, and you'll see the, par the second paragraph is a lot easier to understand than the first paragraph. Um, and, and we didn't do this yesterday, but maybe we'll talk about, before we get into the gospel, we'll just talk about the entire, so, so I'm going to ask you impressions of, of Paul's opening other than the theme and the gospel, right? So Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophet and the holy scriptures. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, for the sake of his name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome, who are now called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
common way that pastors used to start their or some pastors still do start their sermons. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing, I remember you always in my prayers. Asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you, so that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Or rather, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I might reap some harvest among you, as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you, also in Rome. I'm not sure whether they were the wise or the foolish or the Greeks or the barbarians in that, <laughs> in that sentence. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and then also the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Okay. So, <clears throat> what did you notice in Paul's opening? It's okay. one sentence. It's one sentence. <laughs> it, just, it just goes on and on. And I, I remember you saying that there is no punctuation. Yeah. But I sure would like to have an end of a thought to just digest a, a few yeah. lines. And so our translators try to, in Koine Greek, there is no... Um, in, uh, in that period of Greek writing, there was a punctuation. Uh, and so our translators try to add some, but sometimes they don't just because they they, they think Paul is really writing that kind of Faulkner sort of <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's, you know? that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's one of the things. So then, and one of the things when you're translating, one of the things they really have to struggle with is what's um, what's modifying what. You know, which of these clauses modifying, you know, what, uh, what, what comes before it or what comes after it. And, and that's what they debate about. So when they go to pointy-headed scholarship conferences, they, you know, because it can really make a difference. Yeah, yeah so, and that's one of the things that makes it complicated. Not only is the language not our language, even though it's English, but, but also just the thickness of the writing is, is hard. Like reading Faulkner, if you read Faulkner before. <laughs> what, what else? How does Paul introduce himself? What, 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 what's his introduction? As a servant. As a servant, yeah, which is good language, right? A slave, you know, it's the same word. There's no, there's no difference in Greek between slave and servant. An apostle. Yeah, and then apostle. Do you guys, you guys remember your, uh, your, your Bible scholarship on why that's an important word? Uh-huh. Yeah. No? <laughs> Carol says yes. No. I was going to ask you exactly what is an apostle. So, so in the early church, this was a, this wasn't just a word you threw around. This was a title, and it was the highest title. So, an apostle was more than a disciple. An apostle was someone that Jesus had set aside himself for leadership. Okay, someone that Jesus had set aside himself for leadership. Would it be like a pastor? No, no, it would be like a pope. Okay, I mean, so it, it would be somebody that you thought it would, was, was God's, God's chosen to do this. Yeah, so it would be higher than any of that. Higher than a rabbi? Yeah, exactly. So, so <clears throat> and we're not quite sure how this worked throughout the generations and when it stopped being used like that. So we don't, at least I don't know that. Maybe there's some scholar that knows that, but I don't know that. But what I do know is that most of the apostles were followers of the living Jesus because one of the things was is that Jesus chose you, and so you would assume Jesus would be alive. So Paul, is um, he's adamant with throughout his letters of calling himself an apostle because he had that Damascus experience of a vision of Jesus. And, and so the thinking is among scholarship is that that was a bone of contention with the real followers of Jesus, you know, that, that Paul wasn't, that Paul's a, a Johnny-come-lately who's trying to elevate himself into our role. And so, 
and so we only see this argument from Paul's vantage point. We don't see it from Peter's or, or James or John or, you know, or the other apostles. So, so we don't really know what the conflict was, but the way Paul presents it, it feels like people have challenged that he's an apostle throughout. And several, he makes several arguments in his letters that I am an apostle. Um, the lowliest of apostles, but I am an apostle. He'll say something like that. So, yeah. So, wait, but the, I think the important thing for Romans is that he's, got, he's writing to Romans and he's leading with that. That that's important. That they know that, you know, I'm not just a pastor or a rabbi that's mm-hmm. writing to you. I'm, I'm an apostle that's writing to you. So, he's, so that, that's important. So, that, that's good eyes to see that. And he's set apart. You know, he's called by God to do this. And, um, and, and, and then he shares the gospel that he understands. And, and then he talks about wanting to come there. And we talked a little bit about that last week, right? That he, that he wants to come there, that they, he's got this fourth journey planned. All he's got to do is get back to Jerusalem and drop off the money that he's been collecting that I heard, that you heard mentioned in James real quick. By the way, I had two different people tell me um, from after this Sunday sermon, if you heard it, that they were completely lost, that they had no idea what I was talking about. So, yeah, so that, that's always the hard part when you're, preaching stuff that you, you think, well, I think people understand this or have heard this, but they don't. And so, so that was, it wasn't disappointing to me that they were lost, like, like that they're stupid. <laughs> it was, it, it was disappointing for me that, 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 it, that it wasn't, you know, that it was just too much. It was, it wasn't clear. So. Hmm. But I think it's something you've said before, and it may be in Bible study, and it's like, I need to keep hearing it, right. keep hearing it, that I need to hear things many times yeah. me too. before... I have an aha moment. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and, and exactly. And, and you just need to be reminded because you hear so many things, so you need to keep pulling that strand back into the uh-huh. into the Afghan, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as you're kind of felt, kind of keep pulling it back in. Weave it in again. Yep. <laughs> Weave it in again. There you go. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, so, so he's going to make this fourth turn. He's going to drop off that money, and then of course he goes to drop off that money, and he gets arrested. And, and all of his plans go to naught, and he never gets to Rome. And the reason he, we think he was going to go to Rome, that that's in the book of Acts, is because he's planning on going to Spain. <laughs> and, and, he, and he's probably doing a fundraising trip in Rome that's going to launch him, you know, past Rome into Spain, and maybe even setting up a base camp of operation for this part of his ministry, where he'd come back and forth to this Roman church. I did sure. my Spain research after a while. Oh, good. And I didn't really want to do anything. Oh. <laughs> I learned that the first big surge of Jews got, were uh, kicked out of Rome during, with the, well, the part of the diaspora. So that was way, what, 100, 130 something BCE. Uh-huh. And then I, I kept looking and looking for anything special happening with Jews in Spain about the 50s CE. And yeah. I found Zip. Huh. Except that they just said they were part, they were basically treated like all the Roman Empire. Yeah. Just a part of it and a big, I mean, a presence there. And then the next big surge was 70 CE with the destruction of the temple. Right. And then that was it, that's all. And, and then they were around a pretty significant presence all the way to the 15th century. Huh. And, so it was just part of a normal migration of all people around. Yeah, there wasn't any, there didn't seem to be anything special going on with them, but Paul was in the group, so okay. I was disappointed. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, a theory, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so and I like his language, too, about sharing gifts and receiving gifts. This is good church language, right, that, I have gifts to share with you, and uh, and you have gifts to share with me, and, and mutually living together is, is going to make us both more abundant. You know, that's uh, I, I, I really think. Uh, did anyone else find that paragraph just really plain and, and, and easy to understand? I don't know. Was it, or did that seem like a difficult paragraph too? To, to... No, this part I liked. Yeah. <laughs> there's, some, there's some other difficult places. Yeah. I, Paul always has a little bit of a smarminess to me, you know, when he when he's talking to these congregations, like, like, like you know, uh, what, what's it called, a shit sandwich? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know he's, he's kind of building them up, and then he's going to lay lay down the, the crap, and then he's 
gonna build him up at the end, you know, kind of all of his, up his yeah, head. kind of all of his letters are, are the proverbial. That's what we used to call it. Uh, I've heard that. Oh, you never heard that term before? Never heard of that. Well, that's a management term. That's, oh, wow. that's for sure. If you were in management, you might have heard that term. That's a, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You never just want to go to your employee and 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 give them the baloney. You want to get the two pieces of bread there <laughs> first. They're ready on either side, and then go. Uh, um, yeah, so Paul Paul seems to have that piece, um, uh, but yeah, but but it's just good theology. So I got you know our good ecclesiology. That's a better word. Study of church. It's good church stuff. Um, okay, and then so the po- the focus of this, especially the focus of the theme. If you notice in the theme, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? So <clears throat> so the first question we have to ask is, what the heck is the gospel? If this is a theme of Romans. What the heck is the gospel? And um, and in verse 3, you know, in Paul's defense, I, I don't think I don't think he's he sat down and said, I'm going to define the gospel in verse 3. I think he's just kind of rambling and, and rolling with it. And, and, and in verse 3, he describes the gospel. And I say that because maybe he would use different language if he was, you know, if he said this is, this is what the gospel description is going to be from Paul for the rest of my life. But, um, but what, what, uh, so what is the gospel? Before we read Paul, what's your understanding of what the gospel is? When you hear that word, uh, what, what do you imagine that word is supposed to mean to churchy people? Good news. Good news. Yeah, so it, it literally is Greek for good news. So, so, you're, so, you're, so you got that down from... I'm hanging around churches and catechism and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> so it's the good news. And it's the good news from God, right? Yeah. And um, and so our four... Oh, jeez. Oh, Didn't I say this last week? I needed my glasses. When... Okay, Pat asked me a question here. No, she wants me to repeat something. I'm sorry. Can you repeat what the other people say? Oh, okay. We can't hear when you talk. Okay, Pat. I, I got you. I, got I will. It was, it was just Carol Kokai, so it wasn't that important. <laughs> the next time someone talks. Yeah, so it means good news. It, it, it means good news. And, that's, um, uh, and, and the good news is about God that we're sharing. And then we call our first four books of the Bible the gospel, right? So why do you think we call those long books, Gospels. Well, truth has got to be in there somewhere, but, you know, I mean, you've got to start out with the truth of it. I mean, this is, I want you, you're going to be studying this, you're going to be thinking about this, you're going to be mm-hmm. living this, and so we're telling you this is, this is, this is what it is. Okay, so, so, so there's got to be some... I'll, I'll go from truth to trust. Lois. Okay, so helps. Lois says that trust has to be some part of this. That, that this is that the story we're going to tell you is truthful, is trustworthy. Okay. What else? What, why else do you think we call it the gospel? The good news. Good news about Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So it enlarges our understanding. Of God. Yeah. Okay. And, Okay, so Pat said it enlarges our understanding of the God. Lois said the, uh, or Peg said the good news of Christ. Um, yeah, so instead of the word enlarged, Pat, um, the, let's use the word reveals. Okay? So it reveals God. So the good news about God is this revelation. That's the fancy church word, right? Revelation of God in Jesus, which is the Christ part that Peck said. So the good news of God is that we know something to share with you about God that we didn't know before Jesus. You got that? So, so the gospel is a revelation of God in Jesus. Something new that we've got about God that, that we didn't know before Jesus. So that's, And so the reason we call those stories of Jesus gospel is because we're expanding them, I think is what Pat said. We're, we're, we're putting more flesh on them. On all of Paul's letters, you know, scholars and, and, and you know, biblical simple, simpletons like us have noticed that Paul doesn't spend a lot of time talking about Jesus. 
Right? I mean, Jesus is often a character that he refers to, or the work of Jesus, or the revelation of Jesus, or the righteousness of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus, or the cross of Jesus. So we get all this stuff of Jesus, but we hardly ever, we never get stories of Jesus in Paul. No details. No. We ne yeah. Yeah, we never get any kind of three days in the tomb, or, you know, or, you know, or Mary found him first, or, you know, or little town of Bethlehem. We, we don't get any of that stuff. We hear about Paul. <laughs> we hear about Paul, right? And so, you know, so scholars think that um, a piece of that was probably because there were pamphlets and early gospels, early stories of Jesus, that these churches had that they were already passing around. And, and that that was probably part of their original stuff. And, and our gospels come from that. Um, so not to get too far off the beaten track here, but, but the, the thought entered my head. So, so we think Mark was written first, right? And then we think Matthew and Luke were written from Mark. Okay? And the reason we think that is because in both Matthew and Luke, they have whole paragraphs of Mark word for word, as if they had a computer and they were cutting and pasting, you know, the story. <laughs> in it. So they have a whole paragraphs of exact Koine Greek from Mark in Matthew and Luke. That's why we think that Matthew and Luke used Mark, right? And, um, and then, Matthew and Luke have something that Mark doesn't have. They have whole paragraphs in Matthew and Luke that are identical. Okay? Or nearly identical. So, what does that tell us? That tells us that there was likely, and scholars call it Q, there was likely a, 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 a document that we don't have that was circulated in the early church with stories of Jesus, that Matthew and Luke both had, and they were taking pieces from that. So when Matthew and Luke sat down, or whoever gave us Matthew and Luke, you know, they were kind of editors. They took this from Mark, they took this from Q, you know, from this unknown document. And then each, in Matthew and Luke, they, they have a third thing. They have unique stories in Matthew and Luke. And, uh, and those unique stories, then, are, are something that whoever Matthew and Luke were, had themselves from their own tradition, from their own experiences of Jesus, from their own experiences with disciples of Jesus, from, from that. Yeah. So there's like three buckets in Matthew and Luke that we can clearly see when you, when you tear it apart. Are you using the same scribe? No, and they're not using the same scribe. <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so, so that, that, that's how it goes. So, so Paul probably doesn't ever see a need to do that because that's not what he's doing. He's he, he's yelling at them about, you know, marrying your mother-in-law and, you know, that's not accepted and, and eating, eating with people who don't want you to eat like that. And so, so he's got other fish to fry. But yeah. Okay. So the revelation of Jesus. So now let's get to the gospel. So what can we say about Jesus that's good news from God in a sentence? So that's kind of the gospel task. What's What's the sentence we can come up with? The Son of God. Okay, and so this is the sentence, or the clause, I guess, in better English, that, that Paul comes up with. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Okay, so that's his first description, because the gospel is concerning, he doesn't say the gospel concerning Jesus. The first thing he does is describe Jesus. And let's look at the words carefully that he describes in play. When he says the gospel concerning his son, what do you think that means? What do you think he means by that? And the translators have chosen to capitalize that. Koine Greek wouldn't have had that. What do you think he means by that? Calling Jesus son. Well, it's like a bloodline, but there's not blood, <laughs> but that... Proving that he's continuing on what was predicted. Okay, so you're on the next one. Let's we can start on the next one. So you're on descended from David. Well, that too, but concerning his son, just saying that he was part of part of God too. Well, who's his then? His is God. Yes. The gospel concerning God's son. Okay, yes. so let's start there. So this is God's son, and um, and and he's saying something more. Than, than just how we might say we're all sons of... What? And I was... I can preach it! Oh, 
Oh, good. <laughs> He's probably saying something more than sons and daughters of God. He's probably saying something more than we're all sons and daughters of God. And that's why the translators have chosen to capitalize it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so he wouldn't call us a son of God in, in this context. So when he's saying son of God, there's probably, there's probably, probably what's going on is, is there's apocalyptic sort of language in Paul's day about God sending a super messiah that's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that super messiah had a name and it was called the Son of Man or the Son of God, depending on what it was. So, so he's probably harking back to this kind of apocalyptic language, this language of the, of the Jewish faith in, in the time of Paul. So okay. why is it his capitalized? Yeah, <clears throat> that's because um, the Bible doesn't normally... That's kind of a, a Protestant thing that's happened in the last hundred years, where we've capitalized pronouns of God. The Bible doesn't do that. I mean, the Bible translators don't normally do that. I could be wrong about that, though. The KJV could do it, and, and I just don't remember because I don't read the KJV. But definitely the NRSV doesn't capitalize Well, that's what pronouns. I was thinking the King James Version did, so. because... I was confirmed in the Missouri Synod yeah, me Lutheran too. Church, and, and that okay. was a big thing. That, well, there you go. That, 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 so that's probably the roots of it. The King James Version capitalized it, and then Protestant, and that's a Protestant Bible, not a Catholic Bible, and that's and, yeah. and the NRSV doesn't do that any longer. Um, and I don't really know. No one's ever asked me that question, so I, 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 I never. <laughs> well, what? The first time that in school. The capitalized. The, the capitalized yeah. son. Yeah. So um, and any pronoun, it was his. If it was God, it yeah. was it was capitalized, and it really did help to know what was being said. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So I think probably for the NRSV, and that's a different rabbit hole. Uh, I think probably uh, there's been a in the last forty years there's been a, a heightened awareness. Pronouns in general for God, right? So, um, so that and so you'll see that in our hymns. You know, some some of our hymns have changed in ways that are awkward and and just plain weird. Good, good Christian friends rejoice. You know, which is, is not horrible, but it's not the way we remember, it, right? It was <laughs> good Christian men, wasn't it? Well, I never knew that one. Uh huh. Was it a good Christian men? Remember right? Oh well. It doesn't matter. So, but but maybe that's a piece of it. What what I think we what I think we need to hear though, is that Paul is at the beginning stages of Christianity, struggling with how to describe Jesus as divine. And so, what calling him son does, is it is it puts a marker there. <laughs> I don't know how Jesus is divine, but somehow he's divine. Okay. And so, and so that's the first thing. So that the gospel concerning God's Son, gospel concerning, you could say, the gospel concerning Jesus, who God has a unique and special relationship with. Okay, that, that, that probably doesn't roll off the tongue either. But, it, but it's, it's what Paul is saying. That the, the gospel concerning Jesus, who has a unique and special relationship with God. And then the next thing he says goes to what Pat is saying, is this bloodline who was descended from David according to the flesh. So descended from David, let's take them two different parts, descended from David according to flesh. According to flesh, descended from David. Who wants to take either one? Who wants to give a guess on either one? Why is that important to say? Wasn't it the Jewish history um, that the Messiah was supposed to be descended from David? Right. So this is messianic language. This is Messiah language. So this is so what he's saying. Now, if you're a Gentile reading that, you know your eyes are glazing over. Sort of like if you're a 21st century Protestant reading that. You know, Aaron David. Okay, well, great. I'm I'm descended from Harley. Big deal. You know. I mean, no one. But yeah. But but that descended from David is important for his Jewish audience. Remember, he's got a Jewish and a Gentile audience, because the prophecy said that the Messiah would come from David. And, and he's going to claim that Jesus is the Messiah, as all Jewish Christians did. 
that he was the Messiah. So that's what that piece is. And the Messiah was simply a savior that God was going to send to elevate Israel, to free Israel, to, to, to reclaim Israel for God and God's people. Right? That's who Messiah is. So, so Jewish people in the days of Paul, and, and, and Jewish people I think in today's days, imagine that Messiah being almost a, more of a political leader than a spiritual leader. Just like David was more of a political leader than a spiritual leader. That, that the Messiah was going to be somebody who was going to make Israel great again so that Israel then could be a beacon for all nations. So, um, so that was the... Um, and you had the start of this Messiah being something mystical beyond a political leader, and that's that Son of God language that I said earlier. So that, that's that. So that's why it's really two separate things that I've just kind of right. rolled right into one. <laughs> right, yeah, Son of God and Messiah. They're, they're yeah, two yeah. different titles that in Paul's day, people were starting to float around together as this Messiah and Son, but, but also differently. So, so we have apocalyptic, and apocalyptic just means end of time sort of literature. When God figures everything out, this is what's going to happen. That's what apocalypse means. Um, yeah, so, so in that time, yeah, so you do have some where there's two different figures, Son of God and Messiah, and you have others that were there together. And so, so what Paul's going to say is that, that this God, that this Jesus is sent by God, has a special relationship with God, and does also, in David's line, by the flesh. And by the flesh means that he's separating it out from his special relationship with God. It also means something unique that's going on. Yeah, as Pat just said online here, that he's fully human. And, and that's going to be an important thing for for Christians to say. Um, early on in Paul's day, because Paul probably wrote this in 57, it wasn't as important in Paul's day because it wasn't until the next century that there, got, that there got to be a large group of Christians that started denying that Jesus was ever fleshy, that Jesus was always only spiritual, that this divine part of Jesus far outweighed the fleshy part of Jesus. You know, and, and usually I say he was Superman in, in, in kind of a, a robe, <laughs> you know, that he could whip off any time and become bad. And, and again, if you go to our four gospel stories, you can see that you can see that progression from the book of Mark, which was the first one written around 65 CE in the book of John, which was the last one written about 100 CE. So you can just see that progression in those 50 year time difference between the two. Jesus looks a lot more divine in the book of John than he does in the book of Mark. So, um, so anyways, but, but Paul wants to make sure that we hear that Jesus was fully, uh, was fully human. He was, had this special relationship with God, but he was still fully human. Okay? Um, and was declared to be son of God. See, now there's the full title that we were talking about. With power according to the spirit of holiness. Okay? How was he declared to be son of God in your memory of the gospel stories? When he was baptized. <laughs> yeah, good job, Lois. When he was baptized, remember? This is my son, the beloved, for whom I'm well pleased. Mm -hmm. You know, And then Luke and um, uh, Luke and Matthew have a, a story on the mountaintop, too, where he was declared son. Um, and, and then on the cross. And so that's probably what Paul's talking about, where he was declared, you know, where um, where he dies on the cross, and and, and you know, you, you've seen the you've seen the legends in Matthew with the temple, the temple uh, robes or pyramids, mm -hmm. you know, ripping the temple curtain, ripping, and you know, those sort of things. So yeah, so um, um, <clears throat> and you also have the Holy Spirit in here. According to the spirit of holiness, that's God's spirit. That's what that means, spirit of holiness. Um, by resurrection from the dead. So.
so that Jesus was raised from the dead. Okay? And the resurrection, remember, is different than resuscitation. Oh. And that's really key for us to understand. Lazarus was resuscitated. The, the various children that Jesus healed and Elijah healed and Elisha healed, and those people were resuscitated meaning that they were dead and something happened in there and they were brought back to life, okay? But they're going to die again, <laughs> you know. Um, so the resurrection is, is a new sort of idea for Jewish people, but not necessarily a new idea for Greek people. So, and I don't want to say it's unique to, for Jewish people because there were, there were Jewish people that talked about some sort of life after already in the, but that's not a big part of the Old Testament. In fact, it's hardly there at all. Um, and, but it was a big part of Greek religion of an afterlife. And so Paul's going to Paul's going to say that that this resurrection is something is some sort of life that Jesus reveals after death. Okay. So now that I got you completely glazed over, <laughs> let, let's start again. <laughs> so the good news concerning Jesus, right, who is both special from God and also flesh, with power of God through God's Spirit, was resurrected from death and is now our Lord, our Master who we follow. Okay, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ is Greek for Messiah. And so it's Jesus the Messiah, our Master, is what that is, all that title means. And, um, okay, so what is the good news there in that? And, and, and this, this is where we need to just spend the rest of the time. What's the good news in that? If, if this is the gospel story, and that's the gospel, and that is the gospel story, that that that, that God, that God sent Jesus, uh, who was both uniquely God and uniquely human, power uh, with gifted by God's Spirit to die and be resurrected. What's what's the good news in that? Death has been conquered. Yeah, so something about death being conquered, right? I mean, and that's what, and, and so if that's conquered, what, 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 what's, what's the, uh, what, what do you mean? Say something else, Barb. That through his death and resurrection, that we know that he has taken all of our sins, everything that we have done, and he took it to the cross and was resurrected. And he has taken all of that from us. That to me is the good news. Yeah. So and we have salvation. So we have salvation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so death has been death That's has been conquered. <laughs> yeah, death has been conquered and, and that and, and that somehow for us somehow for us we have salvation in that. Because it doesn't necessarily follow that's the case, right? I mean you know, Jesus could have conquered death, but that doesn't mean Lois is going to conquer death or Sandy's going to conquer death. Or, yeah. Right? You know, I mean, you know, so I mean, so so it's good news for us because this has implications for us in our lives. And uh, and, and that's, um, you know, and so Barb already got a little far into the weeds about, 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 about <laughs> you know, about sin and, you know, about sin and how, how, we, how we do this. Because that's what we're going to do next, right? Not next today but I mean but that's that's the next thing well, well how do we take part in this in, in this resurrection you know what what's our role in the midst of that and uh, and and how does Jesus save is you know is the other part you know how, what does it mean that you know the the language we use you know our sins were taken on that cross and and we were forgiven through that Carol I think a part of the good news is that there was People had a chance to know God through a figure that was in flesh and to see what he did 
and to know them, how to live. So they could know God. God was not just a thing that people talked about, but there was an earthly figure that represented God. Yeah, so what Carol said is, is that part of the good news is this revelation of God that Jesus gives us in language, an example that we can understand. You know, that God is like this, right? It's <laughs> so much mystery. And, uh, and, so, and Jesus is like this, something we can get our hands around. And, and I think there's, there's real truth in that. And, I had, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. One of my professors in seminary used to say that um, Jesus, isn't a f Jesus isn't a full, rep a full revelation of God. It's just as much God as you can shove in any human body. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I kind of like that, right? I mean, you know, that there's, there's still even more mystery to God than Jesus. It's just we can't handle any more of it. <laughs> so, you know, so as much as we can handle, that's, that's who Jesus is. And so, yeah, so that, that, that's, that, that's that idea that I've always, I've always kind of, that was a good paradigm for me yeah. to, to live with. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's a piece of it. And so I think it's important whenever we say this is the gospel story, we don't have to we don't have to flesh that part out, but it's important to say that there's flesh involved. You know that, that whoever Jesus is, he's fully human and fully, fully divine. Yeah, because they were just dying to worship animals. I mean, the nerve and other yeah. stuff. <coughs> we just kept going into a world. <laughs> yeah, and and so part of the shame of the gospel that Paul's going to talk about, and we'll talk about next week, is for is for Greeks this idea that Jesus was fully human, okay? Because if you were great, if you were great and from God like that, then you were, like I said earlier, you were Superman in a, in a robe, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so that's part of the shame. Part of the shame, too, is from his Jewish people, and it's the exact opposite that nothing fully human could be as close to God as you're saying Jesus is. That, that's, that's not possible. And, 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 and you get in, because you know the brokenness of humanity, because of, the, because of the stiff necks of God's people, I mean, all that kind of stuff. How can you possibly say that something that, you know, that, 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 that farts and curses and, and, and has sex is, is anything like God? And, and yet, yet here's Jesus. So yeah, so that's so it's on both ends. Both this this human and divine thing is a problem for both his Greek audience and his Jewish audience. So that's part of the shame. It's like from, <clears throat> from that one movie. I can't think of it, uh, but the, the line is, "You can't handle the truth." Yeah, yeah it's from uh, um, oh, yeah. Tom Cruise and, yeah. uh, and Jack, Jack Nicholson, right? Jack Nicholson yeah. said it before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so it's hard. And and the third part of the shame, of course, is that that it's a it's a dead it's a dead savior. And and, and that's probably the greatest shame of the gospel. <laughs> is that is that the cross is at the center of the gospel. We are we are worshiping a loser in the world. Bottom line. We're worshiping we're worshiping someone who didn't who, who didn't lead a revolution and, and, and free Israel from Rome, you know, someone who, who didn't create a whole new religion in the midst of his lifetime. We're, we're worshiping a loser. Paul is worshiping a loser. And so that's part of the shame, too. What, how are we possibly worshiping someone who Rome is stronger than, who Jewish leaders are stronger than, because they killed him? So that, that, that's going to be part of that shame, too. What, what I'd like for you to, um, to move, then, is um, or, or, or to start holding this idea, is that all of the gospel is a macro statement. Okay? Meaning that God is saying this for all humanity. We tend to make the gospel a micro statement. That God sent Jesus so that you might be saved, Sandy. That God sent Jesus so that you might be saved, Pat. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with either of them. But it might be more helpful for us to, to see it as something that God has done for history. 
that God has done for the creation, and then that we are obedient to, rather than even than that we respond to. That, uh, that God has, in Jesus, revealed the future of creation. And that future is called resurrection. Um, so as we live through the death of creation, our creation, you know, the world's creation <laughs> around us, we know that that won't be the last word. Mm -hmm. So Jesus has kind of come back from the future in the resurrection and says, this is where God is taking us. And, and Jesus, the whole deal is, you know, he wants everybody to be one. We're all one. We all believe in him and we're all not supposed to be separated. We're not supposed to be, you know, going hither, hither and yon. Yeah, so a big part of, so what Lois said is that Jesus has this message of unity. And within the gospel stories, a big part of what Jesus is telling the Jewish audience that he's preaching and teaching to, because Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, mm -hmm. is is that all these pieces of Judaism that you are saying are outside of God's love, that's not the case. <laughs> you know, the lepers are inside God's love. You know, uh, women who, who have to do things because they're not allowed to work in your culture, they're inside God's love. Um, people that are bleeding because blood is, is, is unclean, they're inside God's love. So, so Jesus is constantly saying that all these people are part of this future too. That all these decisions that you've made as church, for lack of a better word, uh, are wrong decisions. And we can take that today and we can make the same sort of statements. And we should be making the same sort of statements. You know, that wherever we draw the line and say, you're, you're, out. <laughs> you're out, we're likely to find Jesus on the other side of that line. You know, is, is that same sort of thing. So, so, so what Lois said that, that that's really helpful for me, at least, is that this unity, this future, is a future for all of creation. Is a future for all of creation. Now we can get into, and Paul's going to get into how we participate in that now, and that has to do with faith, right? That has to do with faith and. That's how we participate in now. Now, how your brother participates in it, who has no faith, that's between God and your brother. Um, we can tell him how we believe he participates in resurrection now. But at some point, at some point, your brother's got to decide whether he's going to participate in resurrection now. But what Paul's going to be clear about, and I'll end here, um, what Paul's going to be clear about is that he um, is that resurrection is something we live into now. So we'll add one more thing to the gospel. The good news concerning Jesus, who is both Son of God and Son of Man, according to the power of the Holy Spirit, died and was resurrected so that we might have life too. Right? Something like that. So that uh, uh, so all this is done for the creation, so that we might have this life too. And uh, and Paul's going to talk about that. Kathy's got a comment here. Yeah, Jesus gives us. She says Jesus gives us a new way to salvation. Uh, Kathy, I, I would say that that for most of us who aren't Jewish, right? Jesus gives us a way to salvation. That doesn't mean that there was wasn't a way of salvation before Jesus for Gentiles. Um, but we didn't know what it was, so. and, and now we know. Now we know what it is, and um, and that salvation is living in the resurrection. Okay, mm -hmm. helpful, not? Yeah, helpful. very helpful. I, I definitely got glassy eyes from Peg. I can oh, feel yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel them. <laughs> well, stick with it, Peg. Yeah, she always asks good questions. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, gosh, okay. again, it, it, this is really thick stuff. It's just really thick stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of basic sort of, it's basic stuff that, that, that can go in all sorts of different directions. We can have all different conversations. This is kind of sad, because it was Lois when she said we were all one. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, we are the farthest from being all one mm -hmm. than I can just imagine. And 
we're not unified in our world at all. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so but but it is sad. Yeah. It was just so. But I, what I, I, I pictured for God just shaking his head and going, like, you know, and then just <laughs> give up on them. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the hope is, right? The hope is, and what Carol said is that, um, is, is that right now in our world, <laughs> We, we seem far from being unified. Um, and God's hope is, is that the church is a place that practices resurrected living. Right? And, and so if anything, we could be a place where, you know, where we could take our differences, our differences of class, our differences of race, our differences of politics, uh, you know, that we could take that and we could, we could show a way of being one even with these differences. Because we're not going to be put in some, you know, meat grinder and all become hamburger. No. You know, <laughs> we're, all, we're all different cuts of the cow. Um, and, you know, how do we live as different cuts of the cow and, 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 still, and still be strong community? That's what they call the cow for a while. Well, let's close with the Lord's the Prayer. <laughs> uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you, Joyce, Kathy, Pat.